Yes, thank you very much for having me. And I'm so sorry I couldn't make it. There's some do some bad uh, flight arrangements. I canceled the last uh, minute. And uh, normally we should be doing this, you know, over dinner or maybe networking. But I would like very much to extend all of you an invitation. Actually, I've been listening to uh, Professor Rubiolo presentation and I was uh, quite amazed because uh, we have some uh, common uh, points of research or some common interest. And uh, for now I'm coordinating uh, a volume about BRICS and G7 uh, competition on adversary. As you, we are working on title and uh, we are in discussion with an international publishing house. And uh, actually all of you are invited to write me if you are interested to become part of this uh, collective volume. My email address, I think it's in a book of abstracts. So I'm sorry to say this, but normally we should be discussing this uh, afterwards. But I take uh, this opportunity even if spending a couple of minutes of my time here. I will promise to, to try to, to respect the 15 minutes time. So anyway, we can, um, we can uh, have some correspondence afterwards. And uh, if you are willing to be part of this project, we plan to publish it uh, next year because it's the next competition of the you know, new world order, so to say. I also have a PowerPoint. Normally, I don't do this. I really like to speak freely and to have eye contact because I know PowerPoints, they can be some, sometimes too tough and too challenging, you know, to follow what the speaker is saying and to, to read what is put there on those slides. But because I'm here at home and maybe some of you want to take some notes or maybe to prepare some questions, I'll just, uh, I'll just, uh, um, appeal to this uh, uh, form of communication, so to say. So I just want to see if I am doing the right thing. Do you see my my slides, right? Perfectly, yes. Okay. Um, so as um, um, as we see in my presentation, is uh, related to a very. Um, hot topic nowadays, not only nowadays, but nowadays maybe more than ever, because we are uh, in the context of a war, especially for Romania or for the, and for the Eastern countries in Europe, uh, uh, neighboring Ukraine, we are asking ourselves pretty much every day where this war is going to, to go, where it is going to end, how it's going to end, and we are witnessing uh, all kind of uh, narratives coming from Moscow regarding the use of nuclear weapons. And uh, as you all know, even last year, President Putin moved uh, the posture, changed the posture of its nuclear arsenal. And now more than ever, we are wondering if we are facing a third world war or a nuclear Armageddon and so on. I mean, the discussion are pretty much over there. I'm trying to make full screen, but I'm, I really don't know where. Um, all right, so just moving forward in my 15 minutes time, this would be the content. I'm planning also to extend my paper and to publish it uh, to one of uh, uh, the names of the journals mentioned by you in our correspondence. And uh, just to be brief, the content, the, the paper will be structured like this, like an introduction, defining the nuclear order. Uh, the second is going to be identifying the actors in the uh, ongoing climate, understanding the global effects on nuclear conflict in the 21st century and ensuring or looking for ways of ensuring nuclear deterrence and for conclusion, conclusions and as any decent uh, research paper, uh, I have to present some findings, some future proposal and policy implication. So do not waste any time. We all have uh, seen that today the world is polarized and we have the nuclear weapon states modernizing uh, their arsenal and some of them even looking to pursue the nuclear arsenals. And um, we, it's, really, it's really easy to notice that the conflict between deterrence and disarmament is in the open and the risk of a nuclear war is publicly debated, as I mentioned in the beginning. The nuclear diplomacy is at risk, um, and we can see uh, since 2018, since JCPOA, the Iran's nuclear deal, it's uh, hanging, it's actually on the life support, and we don't have any longer negotiation with North Korea, at least not publicly, 
and you also uh, are, are witnessing a very strong narrative coming from Moscow. Um, I'm trying to make connecting if I can, but I'm not sure I can. Uh, okay. View. Maybe it's here. I'm not sure if you're using Windows or Macintosh. Oh, I have PowerPoint on my Mac, but it should be here. There is an icon at the bottom, the, the one that uh, shows the presentation. More to the left. Yeah, that was the, the first one after the Zoom. Uh, to, not to the right, the first one on the right. Exactly, that one. Oh. If you just click. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, no. well, I think it's a bit, a little bit better, maybe. <laughs> so maybe okay. better to use how you were doing before, because uh, like this, we we see even smaller. <laughs> uh, if you could just unclick on that button, that, or there you go. Exactly. For maybe. us, it can be like that. Not yeah, it should be some some non normally when I'm trying uh, maybe like this. Anyway, so moving forward, I don't want to waste time. Yeah, yeah, just go ahead. Okay, so uh, at this point, we are uh, we know that the only use of the nuclear bombs were in 1945 in Japan, and uh, according to William Walker, we have three lines of thought in the aftermath of the bombing. Uh, and on the matter how we should respond to this. So we have first in recognition of the need to transcend the anarchic systems of state, many supported the idea of world government, the rivalry among states and their acquisition of weaponry should end. Others are advocating for submitting these new technologies uh, to international control without altering the basic nature of the system. And actually, we do have some international institution and uh, the international treaty, actually, the Treaty of Non-Proliferation in order. But um, there, even if they are legally binding, pretty much nobody is following, not any longer. And um, on the third place, we have by submitting these new technologies to international control, and uh, we should not... Uh, I, 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 without altering the basic nature of uh, of the international system. Um, we also have a theoretical approach because it's a scientific research paper, but in short, because this part is the most difficult even to, to, to hear it, but we have to mention it because we have the classical approach to studying the nuclear weapons basically belongs to realism, to stru uh, structural realism, because it's related to anarchical nature of the international system. Therefore, the structural realist views um, the weapons as a strategic deterrent, uh, one that discourages the major use of force by deterrent attacks of the possessor vital interest. But as we see right now, the mutual, the mutual uh, deterrence actually it's also threading on life support because we are still hearing and listening to some kind of threats. So far, uh, the MED, the mutual assured destruction and the nuclear taboo has been in place and uh, they were working. And we really hope that for the future, they will still be in place and nothing will alter them. But anyhow, when this war is going to come to an end in any end possible, we cannot figure it out how, we have to reconsider and we have to uh, to revisit the way and uh, the matters uh, over uh, controlling the nuclear uh, international arsenal. Um, we have uh, this structural nuclearism and it's mentioned also and studied by uh, uh, Booth and Mr. Wheeler in 1992. Uh, and they are assessing that the material characteristic of the weapons determine the weapon strategic effectiveness. And also according to Susan Martin, uh, they serve as an effective strategic deterrent and weapon must have uh, imme immense destructive power to impose costs and that outweigh the benefits gained by, uh, by, a, by an attack. And we also have a constructivist view and a sociological approach on uh, nuclear matter. And um, 
the construction of this view uh, looks at how we think and speak about nuclear weapons. The value of nuclear weapons is not predetermined by their physical characteristics and transformation in the perception of their value can occur if enough people in the right place change their minds, also by Mr. Wheeler in 1992. According to this view, nuclear weapons can be eliminated and their value change if insecurity is reduced. A world without nuclear weapons may thus be within reach. But this might be a little bit uh, of utopia, but at least if we can produce some international agreements of international treaties, at least to stop the proliferation, because actually the title is nuclear non-proliferation, but non is in brackets, because as we are seeing right now, and pretty much many researchers are viewing in this way, the 21st century is not about non-proliferation, but rather about proliferation. So here comes the constructivist approach and our side as civil society, as academia and any public voice, you know, to do our best to change the political factors' minds. So on the, on the, third, uh, the third chapter, um, actually identifying the actors, we all know the actors on the elaborated paper for publication is going to be a little bit more, but you know we have five nuclear states, the most known uh, uh, P5, uh, United States, Russia, China, France and United Kingdom. And then we have the four non-nuclear states, but this is a paradox because they do own uh, nuclear weapons, India, Pakistan, Israel, and North Korea. And we have a nuclear umbrella states, Japan, South Korea, even Belarus now, because as we've seen, they pose themselves under Russian uh, nuclear umbrella and even Kazakhstan and so on. And we have those uh, the threshold states, which according to Pilat, are uh, Japan, Brazil, uh, South Korea, and Italy. And here discussion can be elaborated because there are other uh, other states, including Saudi Arabia and Turkey, which may be informal and maybe not really loud, but they did expose their, uh, or they manifest their intention to acquire or to pursue a military uh, nuclear program. So the third chapter, uh, it's understanding the global effects of nuclear conflicts in the 21st century and ensuring the nuclear deterrence. Because it's it's very important for us to, to understand what a nuclear war or e even a limited nuclear strike, which actually it's also a utopia because once a nuclear strike is launched, there is going to be a counter response. So we cannot speak about only one nuclear a weapon in use and without response because this is actually how it's working. So basically, when we are speaking about this kind of stuff, we have to understand the consequences of such a, a situation, a hypothetical and I really hope never uh, happening uh, situation. We all know the, the followings and the consequences of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki we know that almost 100,000 people died on spots and then another hundreds of thousands of people has been affected and died of different disease. But beside that, we have also a possible uh, a global scale disaster, which can be uh, uh, translated in a, a crisis of uh, security, security energy, security, uh, uh, food, food crisis, and so on and so forth. You know, studies actually have shown that even a regional nuclear conflict, for example, so to say, not to mention Russia or Ukraine, because Ukraine does not possess nuclear weapon, but, you know, a Western side can decide to defend it nuclearly if, God forbid, will be the case. But so to say, between India and Pakistan, or Israel and potentially uh, Iran in some future, uh, such a conflict would likely result in a sudden and severe global cooling that would last for more than a decade. The decline in temperature and precipitation would disproportionately affect the most important grain growing and exporting um, regions in North America and Eurasia, and the result in severe production shocks and the prolonged disruption of global food distribution and international trade. 
also critical infrastructure such as energy systems and uh, global supply chain are strikingly uh, are very vulnerable uh, in such a in such a scenario and we'll, we shall have a gdp crashes skyrocketing inflation power grid failures and as i said uh, the collapse of import uh, export trade and amid, uh, amid rising concern about the possibility of russian nuclear use in ukraine and the later uh, escalation you know from the western side it could trigger it is more important than ever to quantify and reach definitive conclusions about the global and longer term effects of nuclear explosion while this uh, this paper is under development there are steps everyone can take to improve the public discourse on nuclear weapons communicating nuclear effects in less sensationalist way considering the significant difference between nuclear and non-nuclear devastation before drawing comparisons and is spending efforts to educate uh, friends and peers about the true effects of nuclear weapons better communication and clear modern research will increase awareness and catalyze action to reduce the risk of nuclear weapon use and i look forward Jonas, sorry to interrupt five minutes more okay yes i'm uh, i'm you. looking forward to conclusions the last chapter uh, conclusions are about findings future and policy implication which is also under development and it's a sweet generous process actually so this paper objective has been primarily analytical, aiming a better understanding of why states acquire or renounce nuclear weapons. And as uh, just mentioned earlier, to understand the consequences and to, uh, to spot on, you know, uh, uh, narratives uh, to uh, raise awareness about the consequences of uh, such, uh, such uh, unwanted scenario. As in words of a former director general uh, of IEA of International Agency for uh, International <clears throat> Agency for Atomic Energy, Mr. Mohamed Al Baradei, he said technology has come out of the box. We need to have different approach to handling issues of non-proliferation. This should not consist only of controlling the source of the water, the heavy water he's meaning, but you must look at the reason why countries are trying to acquire nuclear weapons. And I would add for myself why they are even mentioning uh, the use of them. Since the end of the Cold War, legitimate questions have been raised about how universally appropriate deterrence is the answer to existential security risk in a world of multiple state and potentially no states nuclear uh, uh, weapons. However, the real challenges are yet to come especially uh, uh, under the light of uh, so or in the context of uh, this uh, of, of this war in Ukraine. So uh, finding solution to ameliorate proliferation requires time, tech and above all decision that can even destroy sometimes political career. And I'm afraid that's the reason why nobody dares, you know, to tackle them at their very core. But uh, if the rise of China and the war in Ukraine is at least for the time being beyond the West control or bargaining power, you know, because there are these are the two main topics of discussion, even in political realm, also in academia realm, you know, the emergence of uh, China as a superpower and the war in Ukraine. So if we cannot control this at the time and we have the history to 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 make it pass, at least uh, uh, the re reducing the nuclear proliferation is within the reach of decision makers and it always has been there and if we do well remember uh president barack obama it has been mentioned he has been mentioned before if we do remember that speech in prague in 2009 when he spoke about a world free of nuclear weapons and actually he won a nobel prize for that i might i might dare to say but from that point up to now, nobody took real steps, you know, actual steps in reducing the global, uh, the global arsenal of uh, nuclear weapons. So even us as academia or social, uh, so, social, uh, uh, civil society, sorry, we can at least speak up about this because we do have the education to do it and we have a voice. And as much as we can make our voice heard, and we can explain loud and clear 
what would be the consequences of such a scenario, I think we still uh, we still have a chance because this is, as uh, Mr. Scott Sagan put it actually, relying on nuclear deterrence or nuclear taboo as it's mentioned quite often. So if we rely on, on nuclear deterrence to keep the peace, it's like skating on thin ice. Just because we've done that once or twice, it doesn't mean we should expect that the ice will be safe forever. Thank you so much.